Well, thank you all for coming. Um, I'd, first of all, I'd like to thank, really thank, from the bottom of my heart, Sangyon and the Deaths Museum and Press for bringing both my, my work and Barbara's work here and bringing us here if, to Korea. It's really been a fantastic experience for both of us to have been in this time in Korea. Um, I'd also like to thank the whole staff of Dats Press and Museum for the wonderful show and the beautiful books that they produced of our work. Um, Through a Liquid Mirror was the title of my first book of underwater work, and it's kind of, I've kind of kept it as a title for my prolonged black and white in a work of the ocean. It's a play off the, um, the book Through a Looking Glass by Lewis Carroll, where Alice passes through a mirror and goes into a totally different world. And I feel like the surface of the ocean is the same way you pass through. It's like a mirror, and you pass through it, and you're in another world with different rules and different truths. In um, 1983, I graduated from Pratt Institute and I, in New York and just got a teaching job at University of Hawaii. I had lived in Hawaii before. So as a coming home present, I bought myself an Econus underwater camera and decided I wanted to photograph surfers underwater. Um, I first tried um, photographing in color and all I got were um, blue. There was no other color in it. And it, the pictures were very murky. Um, so I switched to black and white film and extended the contrast and I felt like the black and white film made the photographs much more surreal. You didn't, you know, it could be swimmers going through the ocean or it could be people flying through the sky. So I liked that effect. Um, the first photographs I took underwater of the surfers, I would just go out in the surf and photograph, you know, whoever happened to be there. Usually I didn't know who I was photographing. But later I um, photographed one particular body surfer named Mark Cunningham, who was considered the greatest body surfer in the world. And here he's riding a wave underwater, being pulled by the, instead of sliding down the face of a wave, he's being pulled by the suction of the wave, the way that dolphins and seals surf. Later, I um, photographed swimmers. I, I started photographing all kinds of people in the water who were very good in the water, who had a natural affinity with the ocean. And the, these are swimmers in the Ironman triathlon. And I remember this particular photograph, I, me and my dive buddy um, wanted to photograph the Ironman, and we went into the water very early. It was around dawn or maybe even a little before dawn, and everything was so peaceful. And then my dive partner pointed up, and I saw a few swimmers come over, and then within seconds, the ocean was a white froth filled with this competitive frenzy. And still, 30 feet below, it was very peaceful. Um, I photographed um, free dive, competitive free divers who would dive as deep as they could on a breath of air, a very dangerous, um, you know, extreme sport. The, this is a free diver diving through the bubbles of decompressing safety divers. The, they go so deep that you can't, the safety divers can't be on air, they have to be on mixed gases. In 2002, we had a, a big international free dive meet in Kona, and a lot of, most of the best free divers in the world came for the meet, and this was the day before the actual meet um, they're practicing. And this is one of the best free divers in the world, a French diver named Guillaume Neri, who, um, this is the actual competition, and he's diving. Um, in two, 2009, I was invited by a big national um, scientific organization to accompany 
their crews to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, which are some of the most, they're, they're to the Northwest of the main Hawaiian Islands, and they are some of the most remote islands in the world. And this is uh, the chief scientist who's breathing up, what they call breathing up. You breathe before you, you go through all this deep breathing before you do a deep dive. And he's um, spearfishing, waiting, going to dive about 100 feet. And this lady happens to be the man before her, his sister. And she's the, also a great free diver. Um, she was the US spearfishing champion, women's spearfishing champion. But here she is diving with spinner dolphins. And she's just turning upside down, swimming under the school of dolphins, turning upside down to relate to the dolphins. And a man diving with pilot whales. And um, a photographer photographing an oceanic white tip shark, which are very aggressive, um, very curious sharks. And they, they'll usually come right when you, they see you, they'll come right at you, and they'll come maybe a half a meter to you, like this close, before they finally turn. And I've been hit by them before. And um, Cousteau called them the most dangerous sharks in the ocean and a school of um, spinner dolphins surfacing and a humpback whale diving. Um, sometimes with these experiences, I remember the experience and the encounter, but the individual pictures I take are kind of a blur to me. I don't remember them. So when I look at like a picture like this, I you know can't believe that for a few seconds in my life I was actually you know in that position. And these are a very rare um, small whale called melonhead whales. And again, um, humpback whales surfacing. I love the way that they are like embracing as they come to the surface. And sometimes I do crazy things in the water. And this time, um, I jumped in the water in front of what's called a heat run, which means a bunch of males were chasing a female. So the female who had a baby with her made very tight circles around me when she came to me. And I could see the males in the background. And I think she was using me because I'm so strange and ugly looking to them <laughs> to keep the males away. And this was on an island, a beautiful island off California in the Cal Forest, a sea lion. Uh, um, and the name of the island is Santa Barbara Island. And this is a very different environment, but it's sea lions also in very murky water off Monterey. And they were with maybe one meter visibility, and they were coming at me. <laughs> and I always loved the way that sand looks when the undertow of a wave is pulling it over the bottom. And I finally got a picture that I felt really captured that feeling with a green sea turtle. And another green sea turtle um, at one of my favorite bays called Hokana, and I love the way the sand patterns um, kind of mirror the patterns on the turtle shell. And a uh, manta ray. In Kona, they have um, these night manta dives where many divers go into the ocean with their flashlights, their underwater flashlights, and create they all shine their lights straight up and create a column of light which brings plankton in, which brings you know, sometimes up to 20 manta rays. And this is again in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. So we, there was a hurricane to the south and it was really rough conditions and there was just one little bay that we could dive in, but it was a beautiful bay. And this is an eagle ray diving under a big breaking wave. It's breaking on the cliff. And uh, again, another oceanic white tip shark with um, pilot fish. And this is probably um, about six kilometers off the shore and about four kilometers depth of ocean. 
and it's very clear water, maybe um, 200 feet visibility. So would you dive down in water that clear and that's like the ocean's bottomless if you really have a feeling of vertigo? Just look down and down and down. A big school of gray reef sharks coming toward me. And hammerhead sharks off Cocos Island and Costa Rica. And this again is in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. It's the most remote of those islands called Kure. And there's these beautiful sand channels that radiate out from the island. And these are Galapagos sharks. And the, these are um, seascape pictures, the beginning of seascape um, section. And this is a big breaking wave on the reef. I'd often go for these swims um, in a bay called Kealakekua Bay, but, and I'd photograph fish or dolphins, but I'd have film left over when I came back, so I'd take pictures of in the shallow water, usually of the waves breaking and the causing clouds of sand, but in this case, there wasn't really a wave, it was the reflections and refractions, the, on the underside of the water and at the bottom of the very shallow water. And um, I did a series of photographs just looking down on the seascape at a bay called Hole Kana Bay. And it was almost because the area was so ambiguous how large an area it was covering, it was almost like doing aerial photographs. So I love the sand patterns here. And the waves would kick up the sand and create these, these sand clouds. Just another one. And then I decided to kind of do a similar thing above the water. And there's these beautiful mountains above Honolulu, behind Honolulu called the Koalaos. And there's always a lot of mist on these islands. So I started photo on, on these mountains, and I started photographing the, these mountains with the mist. I didn't want to photograph them when it was a bright, sunny day, only when it was really misty. And I think the, um, this, this work was really influenced by Oriental scroll painting, which I really admire. And um, I photographed a lot. I did a series called Relics, which were man-made objects under the ocean, but I mostly photographed shipwrecks. And this is a Bikini Atoll. It's a Japanese battleship called the Nagato. It was Admiral Yamamoto's battleship that he ordered the attack on Pearl Harbor from. And um, a sunken yacht in Kona, where I live. And these were pennant fish, and I, I saw the school, the school of pennant fish hovering over the yacht, and I was tr very difficult to position myself so that I could photograph through the school of fish at the yacht. And this, these are goldfish in a sunken water barge in very shallow water at Midway Island. I like the way that the structure of the ship looks like um, Greek runes to me. And this was a, a Japanese fishing boat that washed up ashore on Kiri, that very remote Northwest Hawaiian island. It was a ghost ship. They never found the crew, um, but it washed up on the reef. And over the years, storms brought the ship over the reef into the middle of the lagoon. And at the bottom of the photograph is a huge school of tiny fish, a kind of sardine. and. Uh, what you see on the top is the shape of a passing wave. And then I started um, photographing fish schools. And this is a kind of fish called a holy holy, which I'm still working on photographing. But um, I have a lot of new photographs I haven't um, scanned yet. But I really got into photographing a fish by the Hawaiian name of a coolie which had big schools that were really uniform, you know, really had a lot of form. Oops, I went the wrong way, a little back. And here I just dove over the top of this school. 
So you can see how dense it is. This school. And in this photograph, I was actually diving into the school, and it was like a big funnel. I was diving down into it, surrounded by the school. Uh, this was probably the most dense school I've ever seen. And you can see the predators on the upper right-hand side, which are causing the school to become so condensed. And when I, um, as I spent time and watched these schools, it, I started wondering, they act so much like an individual, like the whole school is the being and the individual fish are like cells in it. So I started wondering what that says about, you know, what is the individual? Is it the fish or is it the whole school? And so I was wondering what this says about life in general, how much we're really just a bunch of individuals or how much we're connected as a whole. And, how, and the same thing with people. Or do we really end at our skin? Are we just this? Or are we part of you know, a larger unit? Something larger, something more universal. So this work really made me think about the, those issues. And these are um, blue trevally, which are predators for the Akuli. And a great barracuda, which is about two meters long. It's hard to tell the scale. And a free diver who I, I told him, you know, you want to see something really cool, come with me and we'll dive on the Akuli. So he dove down and was amazed. Just, he was a good free diver. He was able to dive down about um, tw 20 meters and just sit on the bottom and be circled by the Isakuli. And I actually, I, did, I published a book on Akuli and I felt like I was finished with the project. And just recently, about two or three months ago, I was diving and I found this other school that was different. It, it was an Akuli school that also had another kind of similar fish but different fish called opalo. And the akuli are very uniform and very orderly, and they you know, create these incredible shapes, but the opalo are all over the place. They're just swimming you know, like crazy. They're like anarchist fish. So the combination created all this incredible movement. So it was like a combination of order and chaos together. And here you can see um, kind of an overall view. You can see the coral reef at the bottom. And then above that, you can see the really orderly Akuli school, and then the Opello up above that. But then the silverfish through the uh, Opello are baby Akuli. They're called Halalu. This is back to that island on the Northwest Hawaiian Islands where the Eagle Ray was. And Again, these are big breaking waves, but the waves were filled with tiny fish. And I kept wanting to get closer and closer to the waves. And I had a dive partner. This was with the scientific organization. And she wanted to make sure that I was safe. So she kept saying, you know, come back, come back. And I would try, <laughs> try and get closer. But I was used to being in big waves, but they wanted me to keep safe. <laughs> Um, anyway, after photographing the schools of fish, I wanted to also photograph flocks of birds for the same reasons of looking at that question of what's the individual. So I went to England to photograph starlings. And then I went up to Oregon to pho photograph um, migrating snow geese. So these are the geese taken off from a lake. Uh, this is starlings again in England. And this was on the coast of Oregon. And I saw this, you know, way out to sea, I saw a line, of, just this moving line going down up the coast. And um, 
I use my telephoto always way up, but it's the migrating flock of Canada geese migrating north. Okay. And I keep changing what my favorite picture is, but right now this is my favorite. Um, and this was also taken in England. It was at dusk, very d almost nighttime. And it's um, a uh, marsh with a farmhouse in the distance and this elliptical pattern of um, so, um, circling starlings. And at the bottom, you can see where they're kind of swooping down to land. And then uh, up above, you can see some more flocks coming in to join them. And that's it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.